diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome, I think it was around 1978, so I was 10 years of age, and I just first started by exhibiting the simple tics were mainly movements or motor tics, like shrugging of the arms and jerking of the neck type of tics, which I've just demonstrated to you there. But uh, that was pretty much first up, 1978, and it was diagnosed in those days by a psychiatrist in East Melbourne, in, in Melbourne, Victoria, of course. So I was diagnosed with, with Tourette's syndrome at age 10, so I'm 44, going on 44 almost now, so what's that, 34 years ago, and approximately 12 months ago, I underwent deep brain stimulation surgery. So just living with Tourette's, I mean, geez, it's really not an easy question to answer, if you know what I'm saying, David. My opinion and my philosophy on it is, it's not the worst thing in the world to have, in, in, in the way it manifested itself in me, in that it wasn't the most severe case I know that Tourette's in its most severe cases can be quite debilitating and quite terrible for individuals, but in my case, it was pretty much just learning some coping strategies and dealing with dealing mechanisms like dealing with the ticks. And if you were ticking and someone appeared to be laughing at you or bullying you at high school, you just learned to you, know, you just learned to sort of build walls up around yourself and just sort of get on with it as much as you could. I mean, there were nights, I'll be perfectly honest, when I went home to my parents and broke down into tears and frustrations, all the usual frustrations of a, you know, a pre-teen and then going into a teenager, into adulthood. But you sort of make do and just basically, as a doctor said to me once many, many moons ago, you need to learn to cope pretty much. Medications, well, where do we begin? I've tried at least 10 to 15 different medications. I wouldn't be able to name them all off the top of my head. Neuroleptic type medications such as haloperidol, trade name Serenase. There were antipsychotics such as Risperidone. I tried Clonidine, which is an antihypertensive, antihypertensive, sorry. I tried stuff like ORAP. I tried stuff like Largactyl, all sorts of different medications all with horrendous type side effects for me personally. Tried some antidepressants, not because I was a depressive person with a depressive illness, I was always a fairly happy and upbeat type person, but the antidepressants were, were, were sort of trying to combat the OCD, obsessive compulsive symptoms, which again had very little effect and caused me horrendous side effects again. With my medications taken prior, just prior to surgery, I was on Serenase, five milligram tablets, three times a day, combined with tetrabenazine, three tablets, again, taken concurrently with the Serenase three times a day, and the tetrabenazine milligram was 25 milligrams. Now, the side effects of those medications were horrendous for me. I'd be on the couch sleeping for six to seven hours a day, completely oblivious to what the world was, what was going on in the world around me. I have six-year-old twins now. I couldn't play with them. Dad, come and play footy with us. Come and play do this with us. Completely hopeless couldn't work and uh, that's basically where I was at prior to surgery. Vividly recall initially probably post, just slightly a couple of months or a few months post diagnosis at age 10 as I mentioned earlier. Uh, in those days mind you back in the 1970s not a lot was known about the illness Tourette syndrome in Australia. Given that they thought it was a much rarer disorder and now I tried, they, they sent me the speech therapists my speech was fine, there was nothing wrong with my speech or my communication ability. I was always a very good communicator, even as a young fella. But speech therapist was, was one solution who tried to relax the muscles here and there. It was complete nonsense looking back. They tried their best. Another treatment which I, I uh, undertook when I was, oh, I guess, a young adult, a younger adult, was a treatment, now the name escapes me, forgive me, where they attach electrodes to my head and they had me looking at sort of a, similar to what seems to be a smaller screen television, which was bouncing images off that into, and that, that I was looking into, and it was meant to sort of control the brain waves to help with the ticks. Again, no help whatsoever. Another treatment which I could uh, probably in my 30s, middle 30s, was Botox injections into my vocal cords, which was a treatment that uh, I discovered on, on the internet, which again predominantly commenced in the United States. And they thought by injecting the two vocal cords about in that area, they could paralyze the vocal cords to an extent where that vocalization would actually cease. Again, all that did, the vocalizations did not cease, they came back stronger, more frequent, and more severe than ever. What it only did was make my voice sound like I had a bad cold for about four months. I found out about deep brain stimulation 
I was watching television one night and uh, Professor Richard Bittar, who was my neurosurgeon of course, came on. It was a program I believe was Today Tonight on the Seven Network, talking about a young lady with Tourette's Syndrome who did amazing results with the surgery. Professor Bittar explained the surgery, albeit now it's only a short time slot on television. So I got his uh, Precision Neurosurgery's phone number from the internet. The next day I rang the rooms and had an appointment with Professor Bittar pretty much. And that's pretty much a summation of how I found out about DBS. Look, I was always, when I first heard about it and uh, the success they'd had about it, obviously I, I did some more research again via the appropriate electronic channels, the internet mainly and found that they had amazing success for Tourette's patients in the United States and other parts of the world. And my main motivation was, look, I've lived with Tourette's for you know, X amount of years. I want to be able to try everything possible to minimize um, the stress and the, uh, on my body and the t minimize the ticks as much as I possibly can. And therefore, I, uh, I went into it uh, that way. And of course, in, in close consultation with the medical fraternity, of course. Yeah, and the other thing, dude, uh, Richard Bittet also tells you about the, the risks of surgery, which obviously yeah, any surgery has its element of risk to it. But when you're talking about, you know, operating on someone's brain, then, yeah, I think Richard was saying that the main risks there, there was a 1% or so chance of having a stroke on the table. There was a chance of severe infection in that area. And the, the ultimate risk, I guess, was mortality, paying for it with your life. But I mean, they need to give you those risks. They need to be straightforward with you and explain that to you so you can be adequately prepared. Now, that's an interesting term, adequately prepared. It's, it's, it is full on, but yeah, I, I maintain a certain level of courage and um, you know, tried to be as strong as I possibly could. The journey basically, look, as you quite rightly pointed out, David, you start off by getting a referral from your general practitioner to Professor Bittar's office. I remember the first visit with Professor Bittar vividly. He sort of had a look at me. We talked about the symptoms and the, you know, the types of uh, the tics and the motor tics and the vocalizations, anything else regarding the Tourette's that, was need that he needed to, to, to sort of enlighten himself with. And he sort of said to me at the last, it was about a 20 half an hour consultation roughly, he said, look, Tony, I think you're, a, you're very much a candidate for the surgery. I'll list you as a semi-urgent patient, given that my tics were not severe enough to be listed as an urgent patient, which I completely concurred with. And I saw the neuropsychologist several weeks after I saw Professor Bittar. As part of the journey, I saw a neurologist as well named Dr. Andrew Evans, who I still consult with every five or six months currently, uh, a delightful gentleman in Melbourne. So, And then, of course, they... You, you, uh, you get your papers from the Royal Melbourne Hospital in Melbourne, Victoria, which is where I underwent my surgery. And they prepare you for your pre-op appointment, which occurred, I think, for me, maybe about two to three days before the big D-day, the big day of surgery. And then, of course, it's surgery time. My aim is not to scare anybody out there watching this in future. Yeah, but it's when, when you're wide awake, and I'm as wide awake as lucid as I am talking to you now, pretty much. So, you know, you, you're strapped to this big metal type frame or vice, they, they bolt you to the operating table there. And I tell you what, when they drill, when they, and, and I can still have memories of, uh, not flashbacks so much, but when I think about when they're drilling into your head, I mean the drill going into the skull and it's, and it's reverberating, although you don't feel the pain because you, you're given a, a general anaesthetic, in, oh, sorry, a local anaesthetic in this area, it's not the best of feelings when that drill is going deep into your skull. So, you know, but again, I don't know where I mustered the courage from. Uh, and I guess that's the reason they get you to see the neuropsychologist as well, to make sure you're adequately prepared and uh, you have that, that mental strength to uh, undergo the surgery. The surgery was done in two stages. So after stage one, which is the electrodes being implanted into the brain, two or three weeks later, stage two was, was, was uh, undertaken where they inserted the battery into my, my chest and then they, they wired it all up so it's all functioning as, a, as, a, as it should be. Now, after stage two, shortly after I saw my neurologist, Dr. Andrew Evans in Melbourne, of course, future visits to, uh, to Dr. Evans, I probably saw him every five to six weeks. He'd raise the voltage ever so slightly each time. And now, sort of 10, 11 months down the track, I feel fabulous. It's all going really, really well and really, really promisingly. So it can be a bit of a a weight. So the medication in collaboration with Dr. Evans, the neurologist, and my GP, who I'd visit fairly regularly after my neurologist visits here locally in the Goulburn Valley, 
we don't we, we generally diminish the the, uh, the medication sort of very slowly, very bit by bit, which took around six to eight months to get the medication to its minimum level, whereby now I'm only on half a tablet a day and that's it. Of haloperidol, so it's 2.5 milligrams a day, and that's it. It has very little effect, negative effect on me. I'm not drowsy anymore. I have boundless amounts of energy, and it's really, really good to be finally enjoying life as it as people should at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. Look, a, a lot of people do talk about quality of life and uh, things like that. They use, there's a term I don't like them using because they use it very loosely, and that is it was life changing. Well, yeah, because they might meet a movie star or their, their idol, their musical idol or their, a TV idol, and it was life-changing. Well, really, what I've done, I think, I mean, not so much as the surgery goes, because as far as what, what I've un undergone through the surgery aspect, there are far worse things to undergo. People are battling insidious disorders, cancer disorders, you know, tumours, and all that sort of stuff. Fortunately, I had none of that to begin with. But I've gone down this journey for a certain reason. That was to, to better my, my health situation and my general situation with my family. So, I mean, and this to me, for my children and for my partner, has truly been life-changing, I believe. Pretty much, you know, I, apart from having Tourette's syndrome, I have associated disorders as well. Obsessive compulsive disorder and attention deficit disorder. Now, just to put it into perspective for you, post-surgery, at this stage now, I can study again. I'm, I'm back at school doing my TAFE course, which is unprecedented because I flunked out of high school, not because I was an average or, a, or, or an idiot or a, a stupid kid. I was always a very bright, capable student, but because of my ADD symptoms, you know, the teacher would be explaining something, 15, 20 minutes into the class, I'd be drifting off into some other world or something, you know. But over and above that, the OCD symptoms completely almost gone. I used to have thoughts in my head. We all have thoughts in our head, right? It's completely normal to have thoughts in your head. But visualize in an obsessive person's brain, the thoughts going at you, bang, bang, bang. You have five, 600 thoughts a minute, every minute for the next three or four hours. Quite debilitating, let me tell you. Those thoughts I haven't had in my head since surgery, stage one, gone. I have hair on my head, as you notice. Prior to surgery again, I was shaving my head obsessively two or three times a day with a blade every day for since 1995. So what's that, 14 or 15 or so years of shaving my head. Now I've got hair on my head and I continue to let it grow so I can get a nice hairstyle going, not for vanity purposes, but for me, it's a major victory as well. My only regret, I guess, would be that I didn't do this sooner and I didn't find out about it sooner. At, at, look, it had, at, if I could have my life over again and again with Tourette's syndrome and I found out about DBS when I was 17 or 18 years old, provided that I was a viable candidate for surgery, I'd have had it done there and I'd do it a thousand times over. I'd suffer what I suffered a thousand times over just to, to have this maximum benefit that I've received from the surgery and, uh, and I'm very grateful too to all the people concerned that, that really helped me out. It's, I guess you wouldn't call it a miracle so much, that's speaking a bit now, excessively and embellishing, but it has been quite life-changing, as I mentioned earlier, and majorly successful for me and for my family and my friends. So it's been great. For more information about deep brain stimulation, visit www.deepbrainstimulation.com.au or phone 1300 773 247.